How's it going everybody, my name's Got Cake and welcome to this Star Wars Shovelware review of Exit the Gungeon. Now before I get started I want to give a massive shout out to all of you who have subscribed to the channel and continue to watch the videos that I upload. I'm nearing 100 subs and it's great knowing that there are people out there who appreciate your content. It's what keeps me making these reviews so thank you all for watching and I hope you stick around to see the channel grow. With that being said, don't forget to like this video if you enjoy the review and hit that subscribe button to join the party, support the channel and stay informed on future indie game reviews. Now let's get into the review. So Exit the Gungeon is a spin-off, let's make that clear right now, a spin-off, not a sequel, although it pretty much is, to one of my favourite roguelikes of the past few years, Enter the Gungeon. It was originally released as a mobile game on Apple Arcade, but has recently made its way to the Nintendo Switch and Steam, and will likely be out on the Xbox and PS4 in the near future. Now the first game was a fantastic addition to the genre, and in my opinion deserves its place sitting among some of the best roguelikes out there, such as Binding of Isaac and Nuclear Throne. With Exit the Gungeon though, developers Dodge Roll and Single Core, and publisher Devolver Digital, decided to take the game in a different direction, with the spin-off taking the form of an action platformer called Bullet Hell Shooter, while still retaining the roguelike features of the original. Now action platformer roguelikes are nothing new, with games like Spelunky and Rogue Legacy already adhering to this format, but does it work well when coupled with the bullet hell elements? Let's find out. The game starts off with a short intro FMV recapping the events of Enter the Gungeon, before revealing that the actions of the heroes in the first game have caused the Gungeon to become a paradox, it's begun to collapse, and now they must exit the Gungeon. As the game begins we're dropped into a familiar hub area and begin speaking to Sir Manuel to complete the tutorial before we can attempt our first exit. In this tutorial we learn about the new control scheme and moveset, the majority of which will be familiar if you played the first game. Dodge rolling and iframes, blanks and gunplay are all still present. But the game introduces a few new features. Ascending and descending dodge rolls are this game's name for jumping up and down from platforms, and you're invincible whilst performing these. The tutorial also explains the new gun changing mechanic, whereby the sorceress blesses your gun every few seconds, 25 seconds to be precise, and this'll cause it to transform into a new gun. It's also explained that your combo meter will affect this transformation, with a higher combo meter potentially providing you with a more powerful gun. After a brief final fight with Sir Manuel, we're able to exit the tutorial and gain access to the Gungeon proper. Before we do though, we can take a look at the characters available to us. Just like in the original, the same old faces are here once more, and as before, each character comes with its own unique starter items. We start the game as the pilot, who begins with disarming personality, which reduces the prices at shops. Next we have the Marine, whose military training provides faster reload speeds and greater accuracy. The Hunter is also back with a trusty dog Junior 2 who finds items on room clear. And finally we have the Convict, who carries an enraging photo, which makes her deal extra damage for a short time after being hit. Before we begin we can speak to this baldy looking fella called Taylor. He's a tinker who creates the elevators that we'll be using to exit the Gungeon. He explains that he's designed a route out of the Gungeon specifically tailored for each character or Gungeoneer. What this basically equates to is that the elevators in the first floor are all identical for all characters. But beyond this each character has its own set of elevators, each providing a set of unique challenges bar a few overlapping areas. As we bid him farewell and take to our first attempt at an exit, we get our first taste of these aforementioned elevators. As we begin, the sorceress blesses our gun, before promptly vanishing into a puff of green smoke, and then we're off. The lift will ascend, and enemies will begin to spawn at the target markers, something which will be very familiar to you if you've played the first game. Your job is simple, eliminate all the enemies that spawn whilst dodging any projectiles that come your way. As mentioned before, your gun will change every 25 seconds, and the combo meter, which can be seen in the top right corner, will fill up every time you damage an enemy. If you take a hit though, the meter will be reset to 1 and you'll have to start over. Now this is supposed to provide you with a more powerful gun the higher you get it, but I'm a bit dubious to the validity of this mechanic, and I'll get onto why a bit later. There's also a random chance for a pickup to spawn in the elevator sections. These are often heart pieces, armor or blanks, but also have the chance of being other pickups which provide temporary buffs, such as fleeting guan stones, or this buff called double vision, which temporarily doubles the number of projectiles that you fire. As stated before, the layout of these first elevators are the same for each character, the only difference being in the aesthetics of each elevator. Once you clear the elevator section and enemies stop spawning, you'll arrive at the first floor. Each floor is randomly selected from a pool and can contain any number of enemies. Sometimes you'll get a small room with a shit ton of enemies, and other times you'll get a large room with very few enemies. After killing all the enemies that spawn, you'll be rewarded with a chest. As in the original, these chests come in various rarities. So far I've only seen blue and green chests from these rooms, 
the rewards of which seem pretty much identical, but there's probably a loot table for each of these chests with the likelihood of containing different items. Heading out of the room we find ourselves back in the same elevator and once more battle our way through waves of enemies until we've defeated them all, at which point it's time for our first boss encounter. As is the case in the original, there are several bosses that we can end up fighting. A couple of them are new versions of bosses found in Enter the Gungeon, but the majority of them are new to this game. Each boss has its own moveset, and some are significantly more difficult than others. Starting off easy, we have Buffermore, a minotaur looking fucker whose intro shot is almost identical to the Gatling Gull from Enter the Gungeon. He's a bit of a pushover once you learn his moveset, and the only thing that presents a little challenge are the jugs of milk that he spits out, which explode sending projectiles in random directions. Next, we have Meowza, who is basically a feline version of Eggman, or Dr. Robotnik if you're old school like me. Meowza is tough when you first face him, but just like Buffermore, once you learn his simple moveset, you'll take him down with little issue. The third boss is a familiar one. After the Bullet King's defeat in the first game, it seems his Chancellor survived the ordeal, and has now taken up the throne. This fight's also relatively straightforward, with good positioning being the main challenge. The only move which poses any real threat is his spinning move. The fourth boss encounter is also familiar, and she's a right fucking bitch. The Medusalia is essentially a combination of the Gorgon and the Fusilia mini boss from the first game, and her moveset is the hardest of the four. This is mainly due to the fact that many of her projectile attacks can overlap and leave you with very little options for evading them. In fact, I've only actually managed to defeat her once so far, but luckily she seems to be the rarest encounter of the four. Anyway, once the boss is defeated, you'll be rewarded with some hedge money credits, a random pickup, and usually a couple of heart pieces. If you manage to defeat the boss without taking a hit, you'll also be rewarded with a master round, providing an additional buff. After you've collected all these, the elevator then ascends once more and you'll arrive at the dungeon shop. Here you'll be able to buy various items with the casings that you've earned. These range from hearts, armour and blanks to various pickups and guan stones. You'll also meet the rat in this area who will give you a key for free. This key is used later on to release various NPCs that the rat has imprisoned. After releasing your first NPC, the rat will then charge you 50 casings each time you want to buy another key. Once you're done in the shop, you head back out the door and begin the next floor. This is where each playable character's route out of the gungeon diverge, and you'll find a different type of elevator waiting for you depending on who you're playing as. As with the bosses, some of these elevators are more difficult than others, and I'll provide you with an overview of each character's second elevator in order of difficulty from what I've aimed to be the least difficult to the most difficult. The convict's elevator is the easiest of the four. It's more or less a normal elevator, but only has upper and lower platforms. The elevator is also split into five segments, which move up and down independently at random intervals. Next is the Hunter's Elevator, which again is pretty much a standard elevator that's missing the middle portion of the bottom platform, which severely limits your movement. Falling off this elevator will result in half a heart loss, and a little green slime will pick you up and deposit you back onto the elevator. The Marine's Elevator is much different. On this elevator, you'll have five doors that you need to enter, each leading to a different room. These rooms are randomised and could be large or small rooms, which often contain unique enemies such as this big skeleton at the top, which has laser eyes and fires a bunch of projectiles, or this horrible spider bastard that spits streams of projectiles at you. Many of these rooms also contain traps, which are a fucking pain in the ass, as they're just another thing that you need to avoid whilst dodging all the other shit flying about the room and trying to focus on killing enemies. The final, and in my opinion most difficult elevator, is the Pilots. This thing is a fucking nightmare. It's smaller than all the other elevators and has these big green buttons on it which will shift it left and right on the screen. As it rises, you'll have to move the elevator using these buttons to avoid the big blue thwomp looking enemies. If you fail to avoid them, they'll stick to the lift and after a few seconds they'll explode sending out a bunch of projectiles. In my mind it would have been bad enough trying to contend with such a small elevator without the added challenge of moving the thing back and forwards across the screen. It's so easy to accidentally step on one of the green buttons and shift it back whilst trying to avoid the torrent of shit that the enemies are throwing at you. Anyway, upon completing this first elevator section, you'll usually be taken to a room containing one of the imprisoned NPCs, and if you've got a key from the rat, you'll be able to free them. The NPC will then either return to the Gungeon Hub, where they'll provide services such as shops or cosmetic hats or appear as a random encounter during an exit attempt. Instead of having to clear a room, you'll instead meet a rescued NPC, who will gift you various items, provide an additional shop, or present you with an Angry Birds style minigame, where you have chances of winning some pretty decent prizes. 
so after you free the NPC, you'll return to the elevator and complete its second stage, whereby you'll face another boss at the end. Now from what I've seen, these bosses are often one of the bosses on the first floor, but can also be a new type of boss, such as the Eye Balrog or Gungamesh, both of which basically fucked me up straight away, ending my run the first time that I faced them. After beating this boss, you'll once more arrive at the Gungeon Shop, where you'll be able to purchase more items before proceeding to the third floor. Now I'm only going to cover the Marine and Convict's third stages in this review, firstly to avoid any more spoilers for the game, and secondly because they're the only characters that have actually managed to reach the third areas with. So the Marine's third elevator is not actually an elevator at all, it's in fact a train. It's larger than any of the previous elevators and has several platforms. This stage is where the game seems to step it up a notch and there seems to be a lot more enemies that spawn on this elevator. There are several new enemies that appear including these mushroom guys from the first game and these green ghost like enemies who send out a blast of projectiles similar to the Armour Knight enemies. The Convict's third floor on the other hand is, wait for it, an auto scroller. Everybody loves a good auto-scroller, said nobody ever. It's actually not as bad as some auto-scroller levels that I've played, but it's still a fucking pain to keep yourself moving to the left whilst trying to avoid projectiles and kill enemies. This big worm thing that's chasing you will also eat enemies that get close to it, so you don't have to worry about killing everything. As with the previous floors, after completing the first section of the floor, you'll enter an intermission room, which in my case was another imprisoned NPC, but it could be a room to fight through or a random NPC room. You'll then re-enter the previous area to complete another run through before continuing onward to fight your next boss and proceed to the next elevator. So now that I've given you a general overview of gameplay progression and mechanics, let's move on to my personal thoughts on the game, and bear in mind these are my opinions, and you're welcome to disagree with them. So to start with, do I think that Exit the Gungeon is better than any other Gungeon? Put simply, no. The game doesn't come anywhere close to matching the quality of the first game, and in my opinion there are a few key features of Exit the Gungeon which stop it being as fun as it could be. Firstly is the way in which the weapon system is handled in the game. In the first game you began with a weapon and found other weapons along the way. These were also random, but you were able to switch between them as you pleased, saving your most powerful weapons for when you really needed them. Yes, there were also some pretty shitty weapons, but combined with finding weapons in chests and shop purchases, you always ended up with a pretty decent arsenal with which to make your way through the gungeon. The fact that you could hold on to these weapons and got to use them throughout your run also meant that unlocking new weapons was exciting and you came to learn how best to use the weapons. Compare Enter the Gungeon's weapon mechanics to this one, and it's almost like everything that was great and enjoyable about the first game's loot system has been stripped away. Now you only get 25 seconds with a gun before it randomly shifts to a new gun. Not only does this make it more difficult to get to grips with a gun, it can also really throw you off your stride when you fight a bunch of enemies with a rapid firing gun and your weapon switches to one with a slow charge time. To me, a lot of the guns also felt underpowered, pretty samey, and the combo meter mechanic doesn't really seem to work. For example, my combo combo meter was at 1 in this room and I got a poison shotgun. On another run I had my combo meter at 9 and still got the same poison shotgun. This random changing of weapons also means that weapon unlocks really don't seem to matter as much. As there's such a huge pool of weapons and you may only get 25 seconds with a particular weapon throughout several hours of gameplay. My second major gripe with the game is the elevators and the level progression in general. Yes, I know that it's the main storyline concept for the game, with Baldy Tinker having created them as an escape route, but there's far too much focus put on these routes and they're simply just not that fun. You begin in an elevator, kill enemies there for a while, land at a floor, clear a room, and then it's back to the elevator again to kill some more enemies before fighting the boss. Then we hit the shop for a brief moment before we're straight back into another elevator and repeat the process. Although they may look different and have a couple of unique mechanics, they're essentially boiled down to be in a single room with a couple of different platforms. You have no cover and nothing to interact with, so the majority of gameplay is basically just spent jumping, rolling and shooting. Once you get past the first two areas of game, there's a bit more variation in level design, but each time you play the route for each character, you'll always be seeing the same levels in elevators. At least in the first game you had several different floor themes, the layouts of which were randomly generated, and each room's layout provided interesting features such as walls and tables for cover, and various objects to interact with such as chandeliers to drop on enemies, minecarts to ride, and barrels to blow up. They could have easily improved this game by following this style of gameplay. You could have made your way up through the gungeon through a set of randomised rooms before getting to the top room of a section, whereby you encounter and defeat a boss. After that you could hop into the elevator for a short time, before emerging into a new set of rooms, this time with a different theme. 
fighting the majority of the bosses in the same elevator layout makes no sense at all. Instead of making bosses interesting by changing the movesets, or the way in which they could have functioned if given a few different room layouts, by a couple of exceptions, they decided to destroy any real variation in these encounters by transforming each character's unique elevator layout back into its generic first floor layout before you face the boss. This not only limits the possible mechanics of a boss, it also means you're confined to the limited space within the elevator, and usually fights just boil down to you standing on one side of the screen before dodging to the opposite side to avoid incoming projectiles. When additional boss mechanics are introduced, such as Medusa Lear's wall bullets and overlapping attacks, it often just becomes ridiculously difficult to dodge the barrage of projectiles being thrown your way. Couple this with a slow firing gun such as the anvil and or blunderbuss and the whole thing just turns into a fucking boring snooze fest as you chip away at the enemy health meter whenever you get a brief moment to stop dodging all the shit that's flying about. Now don't get me wrong, the game's not all bad, there's a decent amount of fun to be had and some of the weapons are still a joy to use, I just think that there were a lot of missed opportunities in the game and it could have been so much better. And so I'll finish off my ranting and proceed on to my rating of Exit the Gungeon. After several hours of gameplay with each character, I've decided to give the game 3 out of 5 stars. In my mind, the game really misses the mark, and I'm sure many fans of the first game will agree. The devs can state the fact that the title's a spin-off, but when 90% of the enemies, items, game mechanics, characters, NPCs and weapons from Enter the Gungeon made it into this game, and on top of that you call the game Exit the Gungeon, you can't help but feel a little betrayed when the game doesn't live up to expectations. You can pick up the game now on the UK Switch eStore for £8.99, or off the US Store for $9.99. Alternatively, the game is also available a little cheaper on Steam for £7.19p. Well, that was a long one, but we'll finally come to the end of this review of Exit the Gungeon. I've shared my opinions on the game, and I'd love for anyone watching to share their opinions in the comments section below. You can even tell me that I'm wrong if you like, but at least back it up with some sort of reason. If you enjoyed the review, please let me know by hitting that like button, and if you want to be notified of future reviews and videos as soon as they go live, or just want to support the channel, then please subscribe. For now though, I'd like to thank you all once again for watching, and until next time, game on.